So yeah. our, our next talk will be focused on you know, symptoms and it's my patient is short of breath, what could it be? And this is something that a lot of times I tell the patients, if your doctor is a lung doctor and blaming the heart doctor and the heart doctor is blaming the lung doctor, that's unexplained dyspnea. So it's time to see a heart failure specialist probably. Imad Hussain is one of our, uh, our partners, again, heart failure transplant cardiologist. Um, he did a full year on hemodynamics uh, and he's an expert in the area of how do you put these numbers and hemodynamics together to explain the symptoms of a patient so that we can blame the lung doctor. Imad, thank you. Morning um, and welcome to the Heart Failure Summit once again. <clears throat> All right, uh, so the topic of my presentation, as uh, Arvind alluded to, is how do you evaluate someone who has unexplained dyspnea? So dyspnea is a very common complaint that we uh, you know, encounter. Um, and typically, these patients present not initially to, let alone heart failure, not even to cardiology, but rather they initially present to primary care. So um, <clears throat> start off by what the presentation outline will be. I'll go a little bit over the differential diagnosis of dyspnea. Uh, I will suggest a, a diagnostic algorithm for evaluation of dyspnea that I think may work for you in, in your practices. Uh, I would like to, though, because the topic is unexplained dyspnea, talk about some specific diagnostic testing uh, modalities that we have that can help us delineate the cause of unexplained dyspnea. And then I, instead of starting with the case presentation, we're gonna assimilate that knowledge and implement it on a case. Uh, this is a real case that I saw earlier this month in, in our hospital and then summarize in the end. So <clears throat> when you talk about the differential diagnosis of unexplained dyspnea, um, this is a very broad, has very broad differential. So it's best to just kind of scope it into uh, categories. So whether it could be cardiac, as you know, it could be systolic or diastolic heart failure, valvular heart disease, coronary artery disease that can cause dyspnea on exertion. Pulmonary, typically interstitial lung disease, COPD and asthma are very common. Obesity and deconditioning. Endocrine, anemia is a very common cause of dyspnea on exertion. Endocrine, typ typically hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism are causes of dyspnea on exertion. And then neuromuscular issues like diaphragmatic muscle weakness, um, whether you have some spinal cord diseases like ALS or perhaps Guillain-Barre syndrome or uh, the dystrophies, the muscular dystrophies or the myopathies like mitochondrial myopathies. They're rare, but they can also be uh, related to dyspnea because of their involvement of the respiratory muscles. So, there are various diagnostic algorithms. If you were to do a literature search on how many, uh, what is, how do you approach unexplained dyspnea, you will have, you'll get a lot of diagnostic algorithms. This is one of them that was published in Respiratory Medicine um, that suggests that you go in a tier sequence. So first you start off with simple tests and then you move towards more complex tests. Um, and in this paper they said that you could get to the correct diagnosis of dyspnea, and I'm not talking about unexplained dyspnea. In two-thirds of patients, if you take a good history and physical examination, and you get a chest x-ray. So they said they could have, in this paper, they validated, they said they could diagnose two-thirds of patients that presented to a dyspnea clinic with just those three things alone. Having said that, <clears throat> I have tried to develop this algorithm that you might find helpful in a person who presents to your clinic or hospital setting with dyspnea, and then we'll tell you how it becomes unexplained dyspnea. So it starts off with history and physical examination. I think all patients that come with dyspnea should get a PA lateral chest x-ray and an EKG. Basic labs are very important, in particular the CBC to rule out anemia, complete metabolic panel. BNP is a very strong test, it has a very high sensitivity for ruling out a cardiac etiology, in particular heart failure, but it can be elevated in valvular heart disease, and TSH. And with these basic tests, you should be able to rule out some of the non-cardiac causes of dyspnea on exertion. As a second tier, once you're done with that, and if the answer is not clear, you should proceed with a transthoracic echocardiogram 
and get a full set of pulmonary function tests with bronchoprovocation testing, methylcholine challenge, because asthma is a very common cause of dyspnea in the community. Now, I, I want to stop here and say that you guys have, have who's heard about the stop bang score? Just one person? So this is a very um, good screening questionnaire for sleep apnea with the obesity epidemic that you can use in a calculator and just come up with the pretest probability of having sleep apnea. And if that is positive, overnight oximetry as a screening test for sleep apnea, which is a very common cause of dyspnea on exertion and fatigue, is also a very important uh, test that you can order early, early on. And if you have the capacity, an ABG is also very helpful especially in patients who are chronically hyperventilating because they may have some type of underlying metabolic acidosis and they're compensating by breathing faster and it appears that they're short of breath. Now, if with these testing, you do not have a lead on what could be the cause of the patient's shortness of breath or dyspnea, then you should proceed with cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We will talk about this in a little bit more detail and in my, this it depends upon program to program, but if CPET or cardiopulmonary exercise testing is not helpful, an exercise right heart catheterization should be proceeded with, and we'll talk about that. So cardiopulmonary exercise testing can be done on a treadmill. It can be done on a bicycle. And just to give you some perspective, it is a class one recommendation by ACC AHA to use cardiopulmonary exercise testing for evaluation of unexplained dyspnea. Having said that, I'm pretty sure that you guys will agree that this is not a very commonly ordered test. In fact, it is underutilized in the primary care setting, and there are multiple papers on that saying that why the patients are waiting up to, on average, two years, believe it or not, from their initial onset of symptoms of shortness of breath without a clear diagnosis so when you don't have a clear diagnosis, as you know, you can't treat it. So having cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a class one recommendation when you're not sure of the cause of dyspnea. So what are some of the pertinent CPAT variables that we can look at? So listen, CPAT is a talk by itself. What I'm going to do is, this is not an exhaustive number, number of variables that you can look on CPAT, because CPAT is very dynamic. You can look at a lot of variables and try to come to a conclusion as to what may be causing dyspnea exertion. But I'm going to try to get, get to you some of the pertinent ones, which I think that then we'll apply it in an algorithm to see how it may apply to help us differentiate between the various causes. So peak VO2 is a surrogate. It's a non-invasive surrogate of cardiac output limitation. And the way it works is, as you know, the Fick equation suggests that VO2 is equal to cardiac output times the AVO difference with the hemoglobin in consideration. So indirectly, this at peak exercise, your AV difference is constant and your hemoglobin is constant. So really at peak exercise, VO2 equals cardiac output. So this is peak VO2 is a measure of cardiac output, a non-invasive measure of cardiac output, and it is a very strong predictor of exercise, aerobic exercise capacity, and this is what we look at commonly with CPAD. The other thing important to know is you can look at the blood pressure response to exercise. Typically, with every met of exercise, and you can measure this because of the protocols that you set them at, you should have about a 10, roughly 10, 10 millimeters of mercury rise in blood pressure. Heart rate response to exercise is also very important. <clears throat> Less, if you have Less than 85% augmentation of heart rate at peak exercise of the age predicted maximum heart rate, and we'll talk about that. That, it, that suggests chronotropic incompetence, which could be a cause of dyspnea. And then pulse oximetry. So pulse oximetry you're looking at, and if you have a patient who's desaturating with a, a, a cardiopulmonary stress testing, you know that there is a problem within the lungs. And lastly, every CPET lab does baseline spirometry and baseline spirometry, you can measure something called, and I'm going to show it later on, something called MVV, or maximum voluntary ventilation. And you can actually calculate if someone has a breathing reserve or not. And that helps you distinguish cardiac from pulmonary etiology. 
VEVCO2 slope is a me measure of ventilatory efficiency, and it is a very powerful predictor of prognosis and something we routinely use when we uh, uh, do cardiopulmonary stress testing for someone with dyspnea on exertion. ECG tracing is just like a typical treadmill stress test. You can look for ischemia. Patients can develop arrhythmias during the ECG treadmill test. And lastly, there is something called O2 pulse, and I'm going to explain it a little later. But it is a surrogate of the stroke volume, and it may help differentiate cardiac from other etiologies of dyspnea on exertion. Respiratory exchange ratio is very important to look at when you do cardiopulmonary stress testing, because if you have an RER less than 1.1, that means the patient has not made an adequate effort. So if you have a low peak VO2 in a setting of an RER of 0.95, for example, that, 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 that test, you cannot take that into account. The patient's not given a maximum effort. So you'll make an erroneous conclusion saying that the patient is limited, whereas the patient hasn't made, a, made an adequate effort. So this is what a peak VO2 plot looks like for people who, uh, are not, who don't do CPET testing or don't have a CPET lab in their healthcare facility. But basically, it starts off in a graded fashion. There's increased resistance you set up either in a treadmill form or a bike form, and the VO2 increases until it peaks. This is peak VO2, and then there is drop in the recovery phase. So for peak VO2, if you have a peak VO2 of greater than 18, in all comers that come with dyspnea is generally a good prognosis. If it's 10 to 18, you're in a, in a, in a, in a zone where it's indeterminate, it, it is not good prognosis, but then you look at the, ventil uh, the ventilatory equivalent, VE, VCO2 slope, and as I said, uh, I want to go over that in just a minute here, but if it's less than 10, because I'm talking about peak VO2 here, but if it's less than 10, and your RER is adequate, this is a very high-risk situation in that patient. When we extrapolate peak VO2 into the heart failure population, once your peak VO2 drops below 14, your one-year survival is only 70%, and these are the patients that we consider for heart transplantation. <clears throat> so the other thing you want to assess for is the heart rate response to exercise. I hinted towards it a little bit earlier. But less than 80 to 85% of age-predicted maximum heart rate is suggestive of chronotropic incompetence. The way you can calculate maximum heart rate is 220 minus age in years. And so if you go back to the formula of the Fick equation and then the cardiac output equation, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So if you have chronotropic incompetence, your heart rate is not going up appropriately, and hence your peak cardiac output and your peak VO2 is going to be low. And that is, so the, really, at that point, the limitation to your exercise is, in fact, you're not able to augment your heart rate. And then how your heart rate recovers in, 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 in the recovery phase is also very important prognostically. If your heart rate does not go by uh, less than 12 beats per minute at one minute, so say your peak heart rate was 150, and after one minute, your peak heart rate is still hovering in the 140s, that your heart rate recovery is very abnormal. This is a very bad sign in terms of prognosis. CPET, so the O2 pulse. I told you about O2 pulse. Let's go back to the same equation. Cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. So at, at your peak exercise, when you have peak VO2 and peak heart rate, this association is representative, representative of stroke volume. And this is how it should rise. Your O2 pulse should rise by 10 to 12 mLs of O2 per heartbeat. And if it doesn't do that, and let me show you a representation of it. So in blue, this is that relationship, VO2 over heart rate. And you can see that this, uh, this is the curve. So basically, first of all, you should have 10 to 12 ml per heartbeat increase in, your, in this relationship. And then the normal situation is that this should keep going like this till the end. And at the very end of the peak, it should plateau. You can see in this case, very early, it plateaus. It tells you that there's a stroke volume limitation. This patient is in, unable to augment their stroke volume, telling you that this is a cardiac ideology of shortness of breath. So the VEVCO2 slope, I told you it's a marker of ventilatory efficiency. A VEVCO2 ratio less than 30 is considered normal. It's a very powerful predictor of mortality. 
and it is abnormal in both cardiac or pulmonary etiology. So in of itself, it does not differentiate it, but if you have abnormal VEVCO2, say you have a VEVCO2 40, that patient has a very bad prognosis, you really need to get serious about figuring out what's going on with this patient. And then VEVCO2 in the heart failure realm, we think is even more of a powerful predictor than peak VO2. Um, and this is based on this uh, circulation study back in 2007. And I'm going to actually demonstrate that in later, a little later on. So the last thing is there are a couple of things you can tell from something called breathing reserve. I told you all CPET labs do baseline spirometry. And in our patient, uh, sorry, in our patient, in breathing reserve, the way it's calculated is, it is uh, calculated using both the MVV, which is the maximum voluntary ventilation, and the peak minute ventilation here. So the maximum voluntary ventilation, the way to calculate that is you measure FEV1 in, in, during spirometry and, measure, and multiply it by 40 and gives you an idea of what the maximum, ex, expected maximum voluntary ventilation of that patient would be. And so breathing reserve, you put it in this equation. Long story short, the interpretation of that is normal people have a 20 to 30 percent breathing reserve at their peak exercise. So basically when they're tired and they're about to stop the test, they still have a 20 to 30 percent breathing reserve which you can measure with this equation. If you don't have that, that means you're restricted by your lungs and not by your heart because in heart disease, your breathing reserve remains, remains normal. And PET-CO2, I'm not going to belabor it, it's very similar to the VEVCO2. All right, so now we're going to apply these variables and go over some of the scenarios. So say you have a deconditioned patient, and that's the diagnosis, and you put them on a CPET treadmill. Their peak VO2 is going to be low. Okay, so you're going to come back with a low peak VO2. It does not mean they have heart failure. All low peak VO2 is not heart failure. But when you look at their VEVCO2 slope, it will be less than 34. It will be normal. The O2 pulse, which is a measure of stroke volume, will also be normal. And because they're just deconditioned, they don't have lung problems, their breathing reserve will be normal, and their oxygen saturation will be normal. Now, take, for instance, take a heart failure patient or take a patient who is limited by the heart. Their peak VO2 will definitely be low. VEVCO2 will be abnormally elevated. O2 pulse will be low because they have a stroke volume limitation to exercise. Because say they have heart failure, they can't augment their stroke volume with exercise. Their breathing reserve is going to be normal, and their oxygen saturation is going to be normal. Very rarely in heart failure and other cardiac etiologies, unless it's congenital heart disease, that you desaturate with exercise. If you have a pulmonary limitation, you have peak VO2 is going to be low. Your VEVCO2 slope is going to be abnormally elevated because they're going to have ventilatory inefficiency. Their O2 pulse will be normal because it's not a stroke volume problem, it's a lung problem. And their breathing reserve and oxygen saturation, that they will desaturate the exercise and their breathing reserve will be abnormal. So that's how you can differentiate a pulmonary from a cardiac etiology. Pulmonary hypertension is a little bit of an overlap because pulmonary hypertension can be due to heart disease or it can be due to pulmonary vascular disease, which is predominantly a lung problem. Anyway, their peak VO2 is going to be low. Their VE, VCO2 is also going to be high because they have ventilatory inefficiency because of pulmonary hypertension. However, in most scenarios, unless you develop profound RV failure, your O2 pulse is going to be normal. Your breathing reserve and oxygen saturation depends upon the severity of heart, uh, pulmonary hypertension. If you have severe pulmonary hypertension, you will desaturate with exercise. And so that's how that profile would look like on a CPET. So this is one way how CPET, I can differentiate the various etiologies, especially with a patient with unexplained dyspnea using this modality. Then lastly, if someone is not doing well or I do not have an understanding after doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing as what the actual etiology is, um, then we take them for exercise right heart catheterization. So we go through the right internal jugular vein. We measure their baseline hemodynamics. And then we go over, uh, then we do passive leg raise. So passive leg raise actually increases preload to the heart by 500 cc's. And that, maybe you get your answer there. Um, the wedge goes elevated and you know it's, it's heart failure. Other, otherwise, what you do is you put them on a supine bike and you exercise them in increments that you can set. There are various exercise protocols that you can set on a supine bike. 
and you measure their blood pressure and heart rate response to exercise, and you measure their cardiac output response to exercise. And if with exercise on a supine bike, their wedge grows to greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, that is a diagnostic of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So I'm gonna end with the case presentation. This is a 75-year-old female. She's a retired dialysis nurse. I saw her earlier last month. She's complaining of chronic shortness of breath with exertion for, for the past six months. She's frustrated with her quality of life. It was actually seeking palliative care, not so much even an answer, but she wanted an answer as to why she felt so poorly. She had no chest pain, but some lightheadedness with exertion. She never smoked, and her BMI was 32.6. Physical examination, blood pressure is normal, heart rate 84, 94% on room air. No neck veins elevation, no peripheral edema, lungs are clear, no murmurs. On her labs, mildly anemic, maybe, 11.8, not strictly speaking, but um, maybe. Renal function is normal, estimated GFR, is 60 mLs per minute. LFTs are normal, TSH is normal, and the BNP is normal. So those first tests that I told you, the first tier of testing, TSH is normal, LFTs are normal, BNP is normal. This is her EKG for the interest of time. I see a red light there. Um, this is sinus rhythm. It does not have any acute STT changes. Maybe some low voltages in the anterior leads. Chest X-ray, maybe some mild interstitial prominence, but no clear infiltrates. Overall, looks pretty decent. This is her uh, echocardiogram. Um, at least I think you should be able to make out that her ejection fraction is normal, and her chamber sizes look normal. This is a view of the diastology that we measure with echo, but I'm going to read you the report. So the report says EF is normal LV size, EF 60 to 64% normal RV size and systolic function, LA, RA size are also normal, and there's no significant abnormality in diastolic dysfunction and LV filling pressure is normal. So now I have an echo that says that maybe there's nothing going on. So this patient goes for cardiopulmonary stress testing, and this is how that the report sort of looks like, and this is how the plots look like, but let me go over the, uh, the results with you. So the peak VO2 was 17.4 mLs per kilogram per minute. Uh, so that, for her age, was actually 100% predicted. So she uh, did pretty decent on that. Heart rate response was 88% predicted, so there's no evidence of chronotropic incompetence. The blood pressure response, there was an appropriate rise in blood pressure with exercise. The oxygen saturation did not drop with exercise. The O2 pulse was 11.9 mLs per, per O2 per, heart, uh, for, per heartbeat. This is, I told you, 10 to 12 is considered normal. So this number would be normal, but look on the right side here, on this, uh, the blue, the, if I can, uh, it's not projecting. Um, the second from the top, you can see the blue line. You see this early plateau? So there's an early plateau in her O2 pulse curve right here. The VE, VCO2, however, is very abnormal. It's 44, and her breathing reserve is normal. So even though her peak VO2 is normal and she doesn't have evidence of chronotropic incompetence and her O2 pulse, at least uh, stroke volume, is okay, she has an pla early plateau and her VE, VCO2 is very abnormal. So I am not done yet. Now I have a problem here. This patient may have uh, a limitation, whether it's cardiac or pulmonary, I am not sure. But, so then this patient went for exercise right heart catheterization. This is the RA pressure. The mean was 6, which is normal. Um, the RV systolic pressure is 32 millimeters of mercury, which is normal, less than 35 is normal. The PA pressure was 32 over 14 with the mean of 19, less than 25 is normal. And the wedge pressure uh, at rest was 10 millimeters of mercury. Now with peak exercise, her PA pressures went up to, and I've highlighted it for you here, 62 over 30 with a mean of 45. This is severe pulmonary hypertension. And if you look at her wedge, it went from normal to 30, uh, with the V-wave hitting 60 millimeters of mercury. So this is diagnostic of heart exercise-induced heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And so this patient got a diagnosis. She still doesn't want to seek treatment, but, but, but this is how, a, a sample of how unexplained dyspnea patients are. So in summary, di uh, diagnosis of unexplained dyspnea can be challenging. Systematic approach to evaluation and testing provides the best success. 
CPAD is very useful for evaluation of unexplained dyspnea and is an underutilized tool. Exercise right heart catheterization is more sensitive for diagnosis of HEFPEF than non-invasive testing, as you can see in my patient's case where the echo was normal, the BNP was normal. And that would be all. Thank you very much.